Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone to the uh, continuing lecture on interpreting scripture. Uh, we're currently talking about uh, types, illustrations, and allegories. So uh, we're trying to understand types, the difference between types, illustrations, and allegories. And really, allegories are things that you know people make up uh, based using scripture. Uh, they make up things and then they give their own meaning. Um, so there's no connection at all. Whereas um, types um, are specifically stated in scripture and therefore we can uh, use them confidently. Illustrations are also stated in scripture, but there's a variation or there's a difference between the type and the illustration in uh, how we uh, process them, how we work with them. Allegory are things we make up. So God never stated there to be a comparison and uh, and uh, meaning. And so we put meaning into it and then we come up with something. So I was trying to give some, you know, some examples of it. And uh, we will see a few more examples uh, as we go along. So uh, let's pick up from where we paused. I'm just going to go ahead and share the PDF so we can look at it. Okay, so um, we said, you know, uh, in in in, a in the type and the illustration, there is some resemblance, correspondence. In allegory, there is absolutely no correspondence. We are just forcing some meaning into it. Secondly, uh, the type, there is historical reality, meaning it actually happened. Um, there, in the illustration and truth. Uh, so in the type and anti-type, there is, you know, there is uh, historical reality of both. So the type and the anti, uh, the type and the anti-type, they have actually happened. In an illustration, something happened and it's pointing to some truth or it's bringing out some truth in the New Testament. Uh, uh, you know, some truth is brought out. But... Uh, there is historical reality of something that happened, the illustration. It did happen. Uh, in allegory, uh, you know, uh, something may have been has happened, but uh, the literal meaning is laid aside. Like, I, like we mentioned, you know, David and Goliath. And uh, the literal meaning is uh, unimportant. Just uh, uh, some other meaning is assigned or superimposed on the text. Um, what else do, can we say? the type and uh, the foreshadow, the anti-type. That means that the type is prefiguring or it is pointing to ahead and it's saying like, you know, now what you're seeing is going to come out in a very um, heightened manner. It's going to be fulfilled in the anti-type. Uh, you're going to see this and more in the anti-type. Um, the illustration it's it's not necessarily predictive, but it's more like uh, uh, the, the the New Testament is looking back at the Old Testament and saying, you know, that was something like this. Okay, uh, so it's it's an illustration of this, an e example of this, um, and there doesn't there doesn't necessarily have to be a fulfillment of what. What's happening? It's just an illustration, a comparison. Number four, the type, and we will look at some example, and you know, even I, I, I will be clear on it. Number four, uh, the type is fulfilled by the anti-type. That means there's a higher level of revelation brought out by the anti-type, much more, much more. Like the real tree that you see is much more than the shadow that you see. The shadow has something, but the shadow is telling you something better is coming, and uh, you know that it's going to be really great. Um, so, the when you see the tree, you are seeing you know a fulfillment of everything the shadow was telling you was there. You would actually see the trunk, you'll actually see the branches, you'll actually see the leaves, and a whole lot more happening 
in the actual tree. Uh, in in the in an illustration that doesn't uh, happen. There is some point of comparison, uh, but it's not a heightened revelation. It's not like much more. It's just a point of comparison that's being made, uh, and so on. Uh, it could be totally different as well. You know, like uh, actually um, the the brass serpent. Uh, would be more like an illustration. What I just referred to in the earlier lecture, the brass serpent. Uh, Jesus is saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up. So it's an illustration. Uh, um, that one is illustrating this. The, you know, Both have been lifted up. Uh, something is happening. Both are bringing redemption. redemption. But that's it. You know, um, you can you can look at that as an illustration. The allegory has nothing here. You know, the allegory is basically us making up things, and it doesn't fulfill any particular truth or uh, prophetic element in the text. Um, the type is divinely designed by God. Illustration is designed by God as a picture of truth. Uh, so parables also could be good illustrations. So parables are, you know, they, they, we will talk about parables in the next like in the coming lecture next week. Um, but they are their illustrations. They have truth in them, uh, but they're not, you know, it's not uh, necessarily fulfilled in something. It's a communicative tool uh, to bring out truth. And you know, God is using that, or he, He's picking that out for us, saying this is an illustration of truth. So parable could are all good illustrations, examples of good illustrations. Um, the allegory really is the interpreter's imagination. You know, uh, it's not designed, it's not designed by God. The interpreter is making something up uh, and uh, bringing out something, some insights. Uh, and like I said earlier, what is spoken may not always be wrong, but the use of the text can is actually uh, not correct because uh, they're bringing something out that was not intended in the original text. It's all uh, somebody's imagination. And um, so uh, the, the, the type and the antitype, the scripture talks about this being an antitype or fulfillment of that. Uh, illustration is not referred to as, you know, a type or anti-type. It's, it's just given to us as a story or given to us as a picture. Uh, and certain truth is brought out for us in scripture, right? So, for example, uh, example, uh, in Galatians uh, 3, uh, Paul uses Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac, and Hagar and Ishmael to illustrate the law and the grace of God that has come. So he says, you know, just as you know, Hagar was put out, so the law is sent away. Because now the promise has come, the grace has come. Right? So he's just using it as illustration to get across a spiritual truth. But we do not say that Hagar is a type of the law and uh, Sarah is a type of grace. We don't go there. The Bible doesn't state that. He's just using that as a example as illustration but he's conveying a spiritual truth so we just stay with that um, uh, and 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 uh, we don't call you know uh, uh, type and anti-type in that ca case it's just a, he's just using it as example so like that even the apostle paul will in his writings will use examples now he talks about the armor of god and he uses you know various pieces of armor as examples you know, helmet and breastplate and so on. They're illustrations, but we just leave it there. We don't 
go beyond that and say it's a type of something spiritual that we God has given to us. No, uh, it's just illustrating that these are the things that we need to use in our spiritual warfare. The allegory, like we said, uh, it's not mentioned, it's not stated in scripture. It's people, what people come up with and so on. Okay, so examples of uh, types and illustrations, let's go through it. You know, I, I mentioned some, um, and uh, sometimes even I get mixed up, but I need to really think through uh, on, on what would be. All right, so types and antitypes. So these, see, the type and antitype, it's very clearly stated in scripture. That's one very important thing, right? The Bible really states it, and the Bible actually points to it as a comparison, right? Example, like we mentioned, Melchizedek. It, Hebrews 7 clearly states, oh, uh, Christ came after the order of Melchizedek, meaning in a similar way. He came as a priest. And the, what is the point of comparison? Uh, Melchizedek didn't have any beginning, didn't have any end, meaning it's not recorded. He was a real person. But uh, his origins and uh, his ending was not. So it uses that and says, even Christ, who had a perpetual priesthood, it never had no beginning, no ending. Okay. So the Bible, scripture specifically stating, so you can do a comparison. Then, same way in Hebrews, he compares Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood, with Christ's priest. And there's a lot of comparisons. But he's also drawing distinctions. He's saying, look, under the Aaronic priesthood, they offered the blood of animals and sacrifice uh, animals. But under Christ's priest, he offers his own blood once for all. Under the Aaronic priesthood, people were, uh, you know, uh, uh, faulty men had to do it. So they did it every year over and over and over they, for themselves and for the people. Well, again, Christ's ministry this one who had no sin, he went once and for all. He gave himself once for all, and it was done. So he's, he's drawing a lot of comparison between that priesthood and Christ's priesthood, um, drawing comparison, similarity. Some, the blood, uh, blood covers, here the blood cleanses, also some distinctions. But it is clearly stated. So we can study both. You know, we can study Aaron's priesthood, understand that in order to understand Christ's ministry much better, right? Because there is that biblically it's being compared. So you can study that the Old Testament as a shadow to get a precursor, to get some understanding. And then you come and study Christ's ministry and say, you know, oh, this is, this is the fulfillment. It's much better here, but that helps me understand this. You know, like you see the shadow of the tree it helps you understand the tree. Of course, there's resemblance. So it helps you understand. But the tree, of course, is much better when you look at the tree itself. Um, yeah, I think we mentioned the Passover. You know, uh, the Passover lamb was killed. Christ, our sacrifice, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. So, you know, you can go back into the Old Testament, look at the Passover, how what happened there, and then it helps us understand better uh, or some elements of Christ's sacrifice. Of course, Christ's sacrifice is much more than what was spoken of by the Passover, but it gives us insight into this. The unleavened bread, that was another feast. And uh, uh, the scriptures specifically states, you know, uh, the believer's life of holiness should be like that. The unleavened bread, that means uh, the bread had no yeast in it. Similarly, uh, East is compared to sin. And similarly, the believer has said, you must live a life where there is no East, meaning no, no sin, right? So there's a comparison there. And, uh, you know, we can look a little bit into the feast of the unleavened bread and see, okay, you know, how they intentionally, they cleaned up the house, they removed the leaven out of the house, and, and, and that's how they did it. So we intentionally must clean up our home or our lives and, walk like that. That's the point of comparison in the type and the anti-type. Just a few examples. And so we can look at more, you know, we can make a long list of things where the Bible is in 
drawing these comparisons. Similarly, illustrations um, where the Bible is specifying it, right? But uh, the, the, the difference is that it, this was not necessarily predictive of the truth, right? It's, there is, it's illustrating in some way, there's some comparison, but it's not predicting it. And the truth is much, much greater, right? This has a lot more, but it is an example, right? It's an illustration. So Adam, Adam was called, um, so Adam, Adam, and then Christ is referred to uh, as the last Adam. Adam is the first man. Christ is second man. Adam was the man from earth. Christ is the man from heaven, heavenly man. Right? So the scriptures are comparing that. Right? Uh, both in Romans 5, and I don't know if I mentioned 1 Corinthians, so I didn't. Okay. So, you know, uh, both in first Cor uh, Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, Adam and Christ are compared, but Adam is only an uh, illustration. Right? And he's, he historically was real, but the truth that about Christ is much greater. Right? Adam sinned. He affected the whole human race. Christ walked in obedience. He blessed the whole human race. So like that, Christ is the truth. Adam was an illustration of certain things, right? But not necessarily a type and an anti-type, right? He's not, he's not predictive in nature, right? But there is some comparison. Jonah. Uh, being in the three three days and nights in the fish stomach, it's an illustration of Christ's death. You know, so Jesus pointed back and said, even as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so also the Son of Man. And then, in it is the fact that you know he is going to come back alive, just as Jonah was there and he came out, Christ was there, came out. Okay, and here's something that I got confused with, uh, which I mentioned earlier as a type anti-type, but actually it's better as an illustration. Uh, the brass serpent, Jesus points back and says, yeah, just like serpent was lifted, uh, Christ would be lifted. The point of comparison, the truth that Christ is there is that he provides salvation. The people looked at the brass serpent, they were, you know, they were protected or healed. People looked to Jesus and experienced salvation. But it's not necessarily predicting or foretelling. It's just an illustration. Right? Or uh, Jesus' example. He said, um, what was that? Okay. Um, in First Corinthians 10, he said, you know, the rock, he talks about the rock that was struck. He said, the rock that followed them. And the, even as the people were baptized into the cloud, which led the people of Israel, and the rock from which water came out. So he uses that and he says, you know, he, Paul writes, and he says, that rock was Christ. And so it, it's pointing to, it, it, is, it is illustrating, I would say, um, something about Christ. The truth is in Christ. The rock provided water to drink. That was, you know, a, a, a grace given to them. Christ, through Christ, you know, their salvation, everything released to the people. He uses the cloud to say, just as the people were baptized into Moses, you know, we are today baptized into Christ. So he's using it. He's pointing to the Old Testament events as examples, as illustrations, and saying, this is the truth that we are experiencing. It's illustrated over there like this, you know. So we can say, we can take that and uh, use that as an illustration because the Bible is specifically pointing to it as an illustration. So you can say, you know, 
that rock was Christ. Uh, they crossed the Red Sea. Uh, type of a baptism or example of a baptism, what a baptism, so on. So you can use that. But these are stated in scripture, so you can, you're free to use it. Right? So the point I want to get across here is type and illustration are specifically pointed to out for us in scripture. The Bible is pointing these out for us. Allegories are not. And therefore we should try and avoid, my, my recommendation would be, try and avoid allegorizing scripture. And uh, if you're going to do it at any, <laughs> if you still want to do it, then it's better to tell people, look, I'm just, you know, I'm just using this as inspiration, but it's not really what the text is saying, right? But type and illustration is you have chapter and verse for it, you know, and uh, you're basing it on scripture. And illustration is to bring out truth. Type anti-type is to draw comparison and to help the understand the anti-type better. In illustration, you're bringing out truth from that event or what was hap what happened. Okay, so if in our study of scripture and in, if our interpretation of scripture, uh, we are careful, you know, uh, how we do this, then um, it's good. It's good for us, and it's good for the people that we are. Uh, ministering to, right? We know that, look, uh, I am staying within the rules of the scriptures. I'm staying within, I'm with the text of the scripture and uh, this is what I'm doing. Uh, so it's fine. You know, um, uh, whether you're using a type anti-type or whether you're using an illustration that's given in scripture, okay, you know, it's there. I can use it. I can explain it like this. It's fine. Right? So for example, uh, Noah, uh, what's uh, yeah, Noah's Ark, right? Jesus said, as in the, this is in Matthew 24, he said, as in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days, you know, before the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, that's an illustration. It's not a type and anti type because there is no. You know, it's, it's not like a predictive thing, but he's pointing back from the new. He's looking back and saying, hey, there's some truth you can get from that. Okay. So as in days of Noah, what happened? He said they were marrying. They're giving in marriage. That means they were so busy about, you know, enjoying and going on in life. But there were a few people who went into the safety of the ark. They were taken away because they were paying attention to God. That is Noah and his household while everybody else around was busy with the things of life, marrying and giving in marriage, there were a few people who were listening to God and they were the ones who were kept from the judgment that came on the earth. So Jesus is saying, as in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days before the coming of the Son of Man. He's using it as an example, an illustration. And the truth is, you know, be careful. Uh, don't get caught up with uh, the things of the earth that keep you away from obeying God. So to that extent, you can use that uh, in your preaching. But uh, don't go beyond that. You know, don't say like, okay, we have to build an ark because Jesus said, you know, as in the days of Noah, so, and don't say the ark is the local church. Uh, you have to sign up and become a member of the local church. Only then you will be saved from tribulation. You know, don't say all those things. That was not intended. That is allegorizing, right? Um, the, you just stay with the truth that Jesus wanted to bring out from the illustration he pointed to in the Old Testament. Okay. So uh, we will talk more about the parables because parables are also fall under this category of illustration where he uses illustrations from our world uh, to tell us truth, 
spiritual truth. Okay, but let me pause here and see if uh, there are any questions at this point uh, uh, from anybody in the class. You want me to explain, or if you want to, um, you want me to, you know, if, if there's a particular example you want to look into, and we can work on it together. Uh, hi, Pastor. Mm. Go ahead, John. Uh, Pastor, the, the book of uh, Song of Songs. Um, how do we interpret that? And I think most of the people consider uh, in, interpret it as an allegorical mm. way. Mm. Um, how do we deal with that? Mm. Very good, very good. Yeah. So, like you rightly said, a lot of sermons that are preached out of the songs of Solomon, or Song of Songs, are actually allegories, meaning. That is not what the scripture intended. So it's just human imagination at work. Now, of course, people are not going to say wrong things, meaning they're not going to, uh, most of the songs are like, you know, okay, they're comparing uh, Solomon as Christ and, you know, the the woman as uh, as uh, as the bride, uh, as, uh, as the church. And so they put it, but actually that is not correct interpretation of scripture. Because that was not what was intended. So you say, well, what was Songs of so Songs of Solomon about? Well, it is talking about human love. It's talking about, you know, what Solomon went through. And uh, it is um, talking about his emotional experience, I mean, his experiences uh, uh, and so on. So you read it for that, and 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 show. But but why is it in the Bible? Well, God put it there to show that there's nothing wrong with the uh, with human love, and as long as it's kept in the place that God wanted it to be, it's fine. Then you say, but why can't we interpret it as uh, Christ and the bride? Because of this reason, nowhere in the Bible is it stated to do that. Right. So we see that types are actually stated. In scripture, illustrations are actually stated in scripture. So, Song of Solomon doesn't, it's not stated. You know, example, if there was a New Testament, somewhere in the New Testament, it said, you know, as Solomon and the Shulamite woman were in love with each other, so is Christ in love with the church. Example, I'm just saying, if there was a verse like that, then yes, then we could go back and, uh, you know, we are authorized to interpret Song of Solomon as though it was an uh, illustration of Christ's relationship with the church. But sadly, there's not a single verse in the New Testament or anywhere in the Bible that is referring to Song of Solomon like that. So uh, I would say we should not do it because it's not the correct handling of scripture. But sadly, there are lots of books and songs and all of that <laughs> that have come out and people just go with it. But if you look at it with, uh, you know, with saying like, I, I want to stay true to the handling of scripture, that's something we should not do. Uh, we should not be doing, right? And so just read it as a book that is talking about human love, human interaction, and whatever you can, you take from it and leave it at that. But don't allegorize, we shouldn't allegorize it. You know, and uh, at least I, I I wouldn't do it, you know, uh, because I know that's not what the scripture intends. That's not what the Holy Spirit intended. And uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, just adding to uh, your thoughts in this. So uh, what would be the purpose of having this book in Bible? Like, is it to uh, replicate? how he loved Shunamite women in husband and wife's life or? Yeah, I think what I, I would take away from that is God saw it fit to put this book in the Bible to let us know that he created human love and right? our capacity for human love. So we talk about agape love, which is the God kind of love which God gave us, but he also gave us the human love, whether it's friendship or whether it's romantic love. He created that. It's not against God. 
but it has to, of course, be operated within the confines of Scripture. So God saw it fit to put the Song of Solomon, the book of songs, uh, in the Bible. And I think the message is, God is saying, look, I created this, and it's part of what I gave you, and he gave to us as people, and it just has to be done right. You know, if you think about the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a very, again, it's a very, yeah, I don't know, I use the word depressing or a very, again, it's written by Solomon. Uh, and you begin to ask the question, why is the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible? And there it tells us that, look, a man who was given the wisdom of God, when he was just looking at things from very earthly perspective. He came up with all this, but God's allowed it to be there because in that we are also seeing God's wisdom. We are seeing contrast between God's wisdom and uh, uh, the human mind, you know, and we're seeing all of that. And God let that book be in the Bible for us to learn from. Uh, and 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 uh, you know, some even some some writers and scholars will say that Solomon was in a depressed state of mind when he spoke that the book of Ecclesiastes. So that's why he, you know, he says vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, is that true? All is not vanity. You know, all is not vain. God created life for the purpose. But throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, you find Solomon making that statement. Uh, why, why would a man who was given wisdom make this statement? So he was not necessarily operating out of that wisdom. Uh, but then God put it in the, let it be in the Bible. So I, I think, um, so my my personal takeaway is Song of Songs, Solomon, Ecclesiastes. God let it be in the Bible for a reason. Uh, we should read it in context, take what he you know what what he wants us to see, but uh, not you know uh, superimpose our ideas uh, other than what's already given for us. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor right. One more question related mm-hmm. to this. Pastor, when we write songs, um, okay, let, we have we have hymns or we have old songs saying, he's the lily of the valley, uh, which I, I think comes from this book. Mm-hmm. So uh, when we also, you know, maybe write a love song uh, or, you know, to, to worship the Lord, uh, can we use any of those uh, as they have used? Uh, what yeah yeah i i think it's fine because these are figures of speech and uh, these are nice literary statements which have a lot of meaning so when we say you're the lily of the valley uh, of course it's a phrase in song of solomon we're using portion of scripture text uh, but we are, we are using that figure of speech to the lord and that's perfectly fine you know or you're the rose of Sharon, or you're the ba- his banner over me is love. Uh, of course, these are all statements from scripture, scriptural texts, and we're using it to the Lord. Uh, and they're figures of speech, so it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Even but, though the okay. even though the context in which it was used was used different, right? It was the woman saying it to Solomon, you are the lily of the valley, or, or, or sorry, Solomon saying it to the woman, you know, whatever context you're. Uh, the context is different, but it's a figure of speech that we are using towards God. Yeah. Okay, I, I saw somebody else's hand raised. Uh, I think it is. Colin? So yes, Pastor. Oh, yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, there is somewhere I read uh, a book they call Unlocking the Bible. It was written by David, David D. Paulson. Mm-hmm. He was an English theologian. He died of, in 2019, I think. But uh, he was explaining that uh, when, Sam, when King Solomon, these three books that he wrote were portraying how he lived his life uh, on a, the historical point of view. Mm-hmm. That Songs of Solomon, he wrote it when he was in his young age. In fact, he was that lady being mentioned there was uh, his co-designed lady because every man should have one lady. And uh, it was uh, the, th- the 33rd lady. And when he was writing, 
he wrote it when he was a young man. When he was writing Proverbs, he was middle age, trying to give his son some advice. And uh, because we see that there is a, a masculine and a feminine gender w when we, we read the, the Proverbs. And at the same time, when he was writing the last book, which <laughs> the name is hard for me, but I call it The Preacher. Mm -hmm. uh, when he was writing The Preacher, he was an old man seeing that having reign after, after th 300 wives and 700 concubines, <laughs> he <laughs> really saw <laughs> that uh, life was vanity if you do chase physical and human things. Mm. But if you really do follow what the Lord says, it will always be fruitful. Mm. That's what they had to say that, Pastor. Thank you so much. Very good, very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Good insight. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and that's, that's a nice, uh, nice insight, you know, um, which I haven't read before. So it's good, very nice, very nice. Thanks for sharing. I, it's a good way to look at it, you know, different stages of his life and what he wrote. Good. Any other question? Let me see in the chat, anything. Okay. Okay. If there are no more questions, um, our next chapter, let me just start off the next chapter and then we will continue it next week. So we've looked at types, illustrations, allegories. Good example of illustrations are the parables. So we'll just uh, go into a, a little bit about uh, the parables, and then we will continue it next next week. Right? Okay. So parable. So again, the parable is, uh, you know, we we would say it's figurative. It's analogy, it's illustration uh, uh, that are true life, true true life stories or activities, things that we are actually doing here on earth. Um, and of course, they're taken from Bible times. So, you know, we will have stories about the shepherd and the sheep and the sower and the fisherman and so on and so forth. So, Jesus used these stories in order to, just like illustration, we said illustration is pointing to spiritual truth. In parable, you can say it contains, or the, the truth is hidden in that story. Right? So in order to bring out spiritual truth and in order to encourage people to seek out spiritual truth or even to understand and to relate to spiritual truth, uh, Jesus used parable, right? So, you know, if you look at the word parable and it's from its roots, root words, it simply means uh, a story that, uh, uh, that is thrown alongside To illustrate, if it's used to illustrate spiritual truth, something you're bringing into or bringing alongside, you know, you say, okay, let, let me add this in here. And your purpose is to illustrate truth, right? And uh, uh, it could also have been meant to understand like short statements that, uh, that are similar to Proverbs. Um, that are bringing out truth, that are, made, that are intended for people to think about, think through. And as you think through the story, you're going to come upon spiritual truth. So Jesus used this. He used these real life stories. And he just talked about these stories. He didn't always interpret this. That's very interesting when you think about it. He didn't interpret the stories. He gave the stories. He said, you know, God's kingdom is like this. And then he gave a story. He threw it in, brought it alongside. So you can imagine if you and I were in the crowd uh, and listening to Jesus, and we remember him saying, 
the kingdom of heaven is like this. And there's a story. Example. A woman, you know, she lost a coin. And then she searches the whole house. She lights a candle and she searches the whole house until she finds the coin. And she has great rejoicing when she finds the coin. So very short, very short story. But it sticks in your mind. And you're thinking, God's kingdom is like this. And a lot of us would be, I mean, you know, if we were in that day listening to Jesus, uh, we would relate to that story because, you know, we ourselves could have done that. You know, something fell somewhere in the house and we light a candle and we go search for it. And until, and when we find it, we are so happy. Hmm. Then he started thinking. Uh, now, Jesus never interpreted it. He just gave the story. The kingdom of God is like this, right? And like that, we know the other stories, you know, uh, the lost sheep, uh, the shepherd leaves 99 in the pen, and he goes looking for that one sheep. And when he finds that one sheep, he comes and makes such rejoicing. He says, Jesus gave a story. Kingdom of heaven is like this. So people listening, they go and think, oh, it's like that. wonder what he meant. Because Jesus didn't interpret it. He just gave the story. They're thinking, what does it mean? And maybe to some of them, they will fall upon the truth. That means they will come to the, oh, maybe that's what God is like. He searches, looks for the lost sheep and uh, until he finds the lost sheep. Maybe that's how God and his kingdom work, you know? So the, the whole intent is I'm bringing a story in, along. The truth is hidden in the story. I'm not interpreting the story for you, but as you dwell upon the story, you will fall upon the truth. You will you will hopefully uh, understand truth. It's intended for people to search the truth. Now, of course, we know that the disciples, the apostles, uh, on many occasions, they would meet Jesus personally and say, Lord, what did you mean? Right? So that means... Uh, they are asking him to interpret. Tell us what is the truth actually in the story that you want us to know. Right. So, um, truth was hidden in the parable, so that those who you know were his followers, they could understand the truth. And yeah, he didn't make it so obvious to those who were not interested. In other words, like Jesus said, take heed what you hear. And with the measure that you give is what you will get back. So the intent was you have to seek. You have to search. Then you will find the truth. If you're not interested, you will not find it. You'll just hear the story and go away. But if you take heed to what you hear and you give attention to it, then you will come upon the truth. You will understand what is the truth that is hidden in the story. Now, of course, the other um, benefit of the story was it was a very effective form of communication, right? Because uh, people would like to listen to that and they would like to, they could easily relate to it because he took um, things from our world and he began to uh, use them to speak to us. Right? So, you know, uh, and I just uh, listed out these 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 parables, and uh, many of us uh, know many of these. You know, the two houses, one on the rock and one on the sand, cloth, uh, wine skin. You know, you don't stitch uh, new cloth into an old garment. Wine skin, you don't put new wine into old wine skin. The sower, the weeds mustard seed is so many, you know, short, short stories or, you know, some, some had a lot of uh, description in it. Like, you know, the, 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 uh, the two sons, the prodigal son, we often call it and so on. So he gave a lot of these parables or stories and 
uh, people could understand spiritual truth from it, right? Now, uh, what we will do is just, uh, you know, uh, how, how do we, you know, today, how do we use these parables uh, or how should we use parables when we are using it to preach to people, all right? So that's our interest because uh, the parable served a definite purpose while Jesus was speaking it to the audience then. But obviously, it is there for us also today. Right? So how do we interpret that for ourselves to understand it? And how do we uh, exp explain it to people? And just some guidance. Yeah? And most of us are familiar with parables, so uh, we won't take too much time on it. So we will pick up here next week. Uh, we will uh, finish our parables. Um, then we will um, get into some uh, uh, the next thing I want to say after we do the parables is to uh, talk a little bit more on allegorizing, like, um, uh, 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 sorry, we'll talk about prophetic text. That means how do you handle prophetic text? And under that, we'll also talk about allegorizing because a lot of prophetic text has lots of images, right? Pictures, we're seeing pictures. And so how do we handle that part? We will pick it up next week. So we will start from here and we will kind of proceed into uh, handling some other things, okay? Um, so I hope I hope you're all uh, following me and, uh, you know, uh, and try and try and put it to use as you study the scriptures and as you, uh, you know, use it in your preaching and teaching. These guidelines will... Uh, we keep us all uh, on, on the right track as we uh, as we go. Okay, so let's wrap up for today. Uh, we have a few minutes. Somebody could uh, pray with us and uh, close, and then we will dismiss. Please, anybody could unmute your mic and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for teaching from teaching about. For uh, allegories, mm. illustrations, mm. parables. Mm. And yes, Lord, as we learn all this, help us to understand the word rightfully. Mm. Entrance of your word, use light. Mm. This is the word. Therefore, help us by learning all this, by the teaching in this classroom. We will be able to interpret the scriptures rightfully and apply it into our life. We will be established in the truth of the world and follow it and do it as your salts and lights in this world follow. And also you may teach it rightfully to others so that even you may Lord glorify. Bless Pastor for teaching these truths to us all. As we go through this course, teach us more, establish us perfectly in the world so that always when you read your word, and share your word to others. We will be truthful and mm. grateful. Do the rightful thing according mm. to will and mm. glorify your name. By all mm. this and by our ministry in this world, your name will be glorified. Others may be edified and mm. brought rightfully to your kingdom and taught rightfully about your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and so I take a quick break and uh, get ready for your next class. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. See you soon. God bless. <laughs>